Good morning. My name is Patrick Honecker. I'm the Chief Communication Officer at the Technical University of Darmstadt, Technische Universität Darmstadt. And I'm very happy to be here and share some ideas about science communication. Uh, in particular, I'd like to talk about why science communication is more and more important. But before we talk about the present and the future, let's begin with a little history. In just 15 years, our communication, and with it science communication, have changed massively. There are many reasons for this. Only one reason is new technologies, which give us success to completely new modes of mass communication. So I'd like to take you back with me 15 years to the years between 2006 and 2007. 15 years ago, do you remember? The first generation iPhone was announced by then Apple CEO Steve Jobs. I think the perfect combination of a telephone, a web browser and a media player. To date, over 1.3 billion iPhones have been sold. Every minute, the company sells roughly 400 cell phones. Every minute. 15 years ago, the micro-blogging and social networking service Twitter launched. Today, there are a total of 1.3 billion Twitter accounts. 500 million tweets are posted daily. Stefan Seibert was the first German government spokesperson to have a presence on Twitter. The account at Rechsprecher, government spokesperson, became an institution on the social network with more than 1 million followers. Seibert and his team have posted more than 40,000 tweets since 2011. Chancellor Merkel only used video messages to inform the public. And here I should stress when I say inform. I mean to engage in one-way communication. Chancellor Merkel was not communicating with the public. She was giving information to the public. Her successor Olaf Scholz set up the account at Bundeskanzler. To date, the account has 340,000 followers. To put that into perspective, the account at POTUS, President of the United States, has over 90 million followers. Let's also take a look at a few scientists. The virologist Christian Drosten, for example, is the most successful German scientific Twitterati. He is followed by more than 950,000 people. Professor Karl Lauterbach, also a scientist and more important, Germany's Federal Minister of Health, is followed by over 940,000 people. Twitter provides a platform for sharing information, engaging with information, individuals and organizations. As of March, there are approximately 217 million daily active users and 500 million tweets posted daily. Daily. That's a lot of possible engagement and a lot of information to get lost in. Sharing information is only one part. One part of what we need to do in order to be effective science communicators. Transparency is another part. Both are important, but we must also focus our attention on how we communicate. We need to share information, yes, and we need to be transparent about our findings. Yes, and equally, if not more importantly, is the need for directed intentional communication. But information is not always wanted. Mistakes are made, decisions are misguided, and sometimes individuals and organizations want to conceal those actions. 
enter WikiLeaks. Founded in 2006, 50 years ago, by Julian Assange, WikiLeaks publishes news leaks and classified media provided by anonymous sources. Let me be clear, I am not here to worship at the altar of WikiLeaks or to encourage the sharing of confidential information. I want you to consider, just for a moment, I want us to consider just how revolutionary of an idea and action it is to make information publicly available. What happens to information when we give it sunlight? It grows. What happens to us when we relinquish control of ideas? WikiLeaks, Twitter, even open source publications. These are all examples of disruption. Of denying the guard its control and of freeing information and knowledge from the bounds of hierarchies, bureaucratic procedures and commodification. So how did scientists communicate 15 years ago? The PUSH memorandum for public understanding of science and humanities slowly began to gain acceptance. In this memorandum, the major German science organizations committed themselves to promoting dialogue between scientists and the public. In doing so, they took British and American initiatives as models. These initiatives showed how the exchange between researchers and citizens can succeed. Ten years ago, Germany's largest funding organization, the German Research Foundation, began offering science communication modules. Today, collaborative research centers, so-called Sonderforschungsbereiche, which want to engage in dialogue with the non-academic public, can implement communication measures as part of their central administration project or a standalone project. A revolution in science communication is supported by the dynamic development of technologies. But don't forget, science communication has always evolved very dynamically. In this evolution, two major phases can be distinguished. Phase one. The phase in which scientists try to communicate their own content to others, especially to non-scientists. This began in the 60s of the last century and was mainly driven in the Anglo-Saxon area. If you type Botmar report into a search engine, you will get to the scan from 1985. I think it looks a bit old fashioned but it contains a paper that describes many things we are still working on today. And it speaks very well to our shared aims. Mainly that scientists must learn to communicate with the public, be willing to do so, and indeed consider it their duty to do so. All scientists need therefore to learn about the media and its constraints and learn how to explain science simply, without jargon, and without being condescending. We should consider, for example, providing training and communication, broadening our understanding of the media, arranging non-specialist lectures and demonstrations, organizing scientific competitions for young people, and providing periodic briefings for journalists. Every mode of communication comes with a different set of requirements, different terms of use. It's important then to keep in mind why we communicate and who we communicate with. Which brings us to phase two. Science communication with the goal of understanding. Here scientists and the so-called layman become partners at eye level. 
Communication is conducted through many channels in both directions. It started at the beginning of the century and is our current working model. When we communicate with the goal of understanding, we create a dialogue. We create an occasion for exchange, for a chance to speak with each other, not to simply state facts or state opinions or take a position without considering anyone or anything besides yourself. Science listens, accepts and gives something back and ideally, of course, the other way around. Scientists and non-scientists are co-producers. Together, they define what a public issue is and orient themselves toward relevant production in their respective contexts. And then... came COVID-19. The environment of urgency created by the pandemic caused political decisions to be based on what scientists recommended. These political decisions massively disrupted the whole of society, decisions that changed very quickly and in some cases comprehensively for many. Some recommendations become rules, laws, and these rules sometimes, now often changed and were, were merry and comprehensible to much of society. And that's because of the way science works, always in search of knowledge, never in possession of the final truth. At first, this was accepted, but then resistance arose. And this resistance was sort of fueled by the ever-changing environment. You see, the frame of mind has changed. It changed from homogeneity to diversity. A diversity of values and new role models. This includes demanding public participants from target groups to stakeholders and the change of the media system. Classical media like newspapers and broadcast corporation are no longer the gatekeepers. All this disruption. Professor Christian Drosten said, the pandemic has shown measures can only work if people understand the principles behind them. This requires knowledge-based communication. End quote. But our relation to truth has also become uncertain. Fake news, the post-factual age, all the digital developments that enrich science communication can also have the opposite effect. We all know the central problem social media poses to objective communication. Many people are stuck in their echo chambers and simply refuse to acknowledge anything that contradicts their point of view. Public debates are increasingly polemic and a matter of belief rather than facts. And that too is also due to numerous cognitive biases. It should come as now surprise then that communication psychology has become increasingly important for science communication too. So, with this that, the other increasingly important discipline, social science in mind, is psychology. And here let's talk about a few psychological biases. Biases which manipulate us every day, but which we often do not even notice. Maybe you're familiar with Daniel Kahneman's masterpiece, Thinking Fast and Slow. Kahneman, winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2002 as a psychologist, describes, among others, the framing effect, the confirmation bias, the Dunning-Kruger effect, the illusionary causation and fake news. Let me briefly explain. The framing effect. 
The framing effect describes the way information is processed in our brains depending on the words that are used. Do you remember when Trump talked about the Kung Fu virus? Kung Fu virus? This regretful choice negatively framed our associations and limited our perception of the virus. The choice of words sets the frame for all further cognitive processes. The words Kung Fu virus set a negative frame while the words COVID-19 set an objective frame. These words and their associations are processed differently by the brain. How we frame an issue sets the tone for fewer discussions. The confirmation bias. If you Google vaccination, you will definitely find more examples that confirm your own opinion. If you are an anti-vaccination activist, you will find a lot more information about damage and vice versa. This is due to the way we search, the words we use and the algorithm that shows us the things we are supposed to want to see. We tend to select information that confirms what we already believe. This confirmation bias is only amplified by this use of social media, which contributes in addition to an increase in loneliness. Third, the Dunning-Kruger effect, and thanks to Steffi Atze for this wonderful picture. Put simply, people with low ability at a task overestimate their own ability. You all know these people. And people with high ability at a task underestimate their own abilities. The Dunning-Kruger effect. Illusionary causation is very well known in statistics. If an event A coincides with or is shortly followed by event B, we tend to get the impression of a direct relationship between the two. A very prominent example of this are supposed negative side effects from vaccinations. Somebody who becomes ill after a shot may believe that the shot caused the illness, even if the two are completely unrelated. And fake news. We should never, never underestimate the impact of false information or fake news. This information also impacts our brain without us becoming consciously aware of it. It creates a memory. Axel Ockenfels, the prominent professor of behavioral economics at the University of Cologne, put it this way, quote, the benchmark of success for a message is not whether or not it is true but rather how much attention it generated, how many clicks or likes it got." End quote. Like it or not, this is the state of media and media engagement. The channels of communication that we champion for their bottom-up, decentralized and unconventional methods create a field awash with information and opinions. Clicks or likes become social capital and without intending it, your publication in science is competing with the Eurovision Song Contest for clicks, likes and retweets. Everyone wants to be heard. Every human being seeks orientation. Everybody looks for studies that support their own points of view. That way, even the crudest opinion can be voiced and supported. Interestingly, however, hardly anyone claims that what science says is unnecessary or wrong. Rather, the question is what individuals or groups of people take to be science. Nobody says, I don't care what scientists say. Rather, they say, this is what my side, my scientist, is saying. Wherever you look, change. Media changes, 
the guard changes, the old gatekeepers, newspapers and broadcast corporations are now competing with social media networks. Network boundaries change and hierarchies change. Social media enables an individual to be their own broadcaster. Indexes change. The way we label information, the hashtag. Accessibility change. The value of knowledge changes and we change. This is our nature. And let's not forget, people also make decisions based on intuition or religion or astrology. But science does not change. Its methods change. Certainly, the accepted views of knowledge change. But science remains an intellectual and practical activity, a collaboration between each other and the natural world. Technology evolves at an exponential rate. The way we communicate evolves at an exponential rate. And with it, fake news is also created and delivered in an exponential rate. So how can we focus on what is important at this incredible speed? Again, this is why we have to focus on methods, on evidence-based research, and we have to explain what things mean. One of the possibilities for science to maintain trust is good communication about what is being done and how. However, we are making an effort to explain scientific methods and why certain methods are unscientific. We can hope to have a positive impact and maintain trust in science. This trust in valid information is increasingly important for politicians. Because democratic decisions can only be made on the basis of valid, shared information. Take, for example, the German Science Council, the most important science policy advisory body in Germany. The Science Council just published a paper on science communication. And in this paper is described the function and goals of science communication. Inform and clarify enable dialogue and participation, offer advice and solutions, illustrate the meaning of science, spark an interest in science and create awareness. The coalition agreement of the federal government contains what I consider to be a clear statement on science communication. Quote, science is not a closed system but thrives on exchange and communication with society. We want to systematically integrate science communication at all scientific career stages in the approval of fundings." End quote. The amount of information available at any given time is immense. Factor in the various actors and voices, and it can seem as though you're engulfed in a fog. Good science communication is like a flashlight that cuts through this fog. Good science communication fosters dialogue between scientists and diverse audiences. It increases also scientific literacy, promotes public trust in science and strengthens decision-making processes on all levels. So what do we have to do? First remember Scientist, you all are the most important communicators inside an institution, in our institutions. These institutions need to provide scientists with legal, psychological and communication support. We, as institutions, need to establish low threshold trainings and coaching opportunities for science communication. And these offerings should be available to everyone from early career researchers to principal investigators. We need to empower the entire institution to communicate in a timely, professional manner, and we must establish processes for continuous strategic development, both centrally and also in specific scientific areas. Consider the alignment with goals. It's like a pyramid, you see? 
At the top of the pyramid, you have a vision and identity. You need a perceptual identity for all target groups with defined identity building blocks. You have to define strategic overall goals, communication goals from strategic fields. You have to find strategic area goals, communication goals from the departments and institutions. As scientists, as institutions, it is important to consider our reasons for using communication tools. What are we saying? Who is our intended audience? What do we want them to do? Are we casting words into the void, sharing information just because? And hoping for a like, retweet or click, like someone fishing off a bridge in the dark? If we can't see the water, how can we know if we are fishing at all? If we are not aware of our audience, how do we know we are speaking to anyone? Knowing our audience, knowing where and how we communicate with each other, help us to plan. Which categories we can identify target groups and stakeholders, say, people in Germany, Europe, worldwide, who are interested in our specific science. Now we have target group and stakeholders. Yes, it is a large one at the beginning, but once we have a target group, we can begin to make associations, small connections, big connections, which help us to build a community. This brings us, as last but not least, to operational objectives. Our requirements for achieving strategic goals, daily tasks required to operate a university. Ideally, the success of one objective is directly proportional to another. We succeed when we all succeed. It's all just a form of reciprocation. We need also to develop a central pool of communication service back to the roots. For example, digital communication, video and audio production, as well as text and design units. But what does it mean for you as a scientist? It means, first, that you do not have to communicate everything yourself. The core of your work is research and teaching, a challenging activity, especially if you consider all the time invested in additional tasks like administration and committee work. And let me emphasize, there are communication professionals in your universities who can support you. Take advantage of what they have to offer. But remember, hundreds of your colleagues already do exactly the same. What else does that mean for you as a scientist? As you may know, Building a personal brand is complex. So if you want to communicate, do it systematically. Ask yourself, what is my unique selling proposition? Who are my competitors? Consider your analysis and market research. Then ask, what goals do I have? What are the performance indicators? Can I formulate key messages about my work? which communication channels are best suited to reach my target groups and stakeholders? And finally, how do I check the success of my communication work and how can I optimize it? Personal rebranding requires all kinds of communication and strategic processes from analysis market research, definition of goals, key messages, implementation of the communication mix, review and improvement, and whether you improve your own brand or reputation. Hmm. This sequence, for example, helps to focus on reaching key performance indicators in your whole work. This may sound like a lot. It is. But... This responsibility possesses enormous potential for holistic change. This responsibility is motivation too. And so here, 
I would like to continue with a case study. This form of recommendation to improve our institutions. Let me give an example of how this could look. Consider what we've accomplished at TU Darmstadt. Right now we are developing a new structure, a kind of comprehensive service center to support science communication. The center will work for all institutions at the university, for scientists with consulting, but also with practical things like writing newspaper articles or press releases, or even help to develop an online presence. Everything from a Twitter account to a professional website outlining your research topics. Important, we need to establish low threshold trainings and coaching opportunities for science communication. At TU Darmstadt, we have anchored communication at a strategic level and we are now in process of integrating an online training platform together with our graduate organization and the Vice President for Research. Development is currently in the hands of the National Institute of Science Communication at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Additionally, we have been able to win over one of Germany's most renowned science journalists, Dr. Jan Martin Viada, to serve as lecturer in science communication. We have also started to strengthen our central digital communication. We have acquired an experienced social media manager who has worked as head of online marketing for several successful companies. In the future, she will mainly roll out digital parameter-based campaigns for the university. As Chief Communication Officer, I try to update the communication and marketing strategy. And I hope, I really hope to expand mutual communication via all relevant channels, especially digital or visual channels. And if I'm successful, I help provide impulses for holistic communication. At TU Darmstadt, we are now having discussions and workshops with many members of the university because we want to know what an ideal future communication would look like. When we show processes and methods, when we are transparent, when we don't simply announce results, when they keep the lines of communication open and that science speaks for itself, it is then and only then that we broaden the understanding of scientific work. Then that science maintains public trust, then that we deepen an awareness in science, and then that we foster dialogue and mutual participation. This range of services aiding the overall effectiveness of scientific communication is our imperative. Because without clear communication and reciprocal exchange, strategic aims are nothing but ideas. People are afraid right now, anxious and nervous about the future. Anticipation has become increasingly synonymous with fear and closure instead of with curiosity and openness. We should be investing our resources, our times, our effort and yes, our money in science. The future should be a welcomed unknown, a future we illuminate with dialogue. Please take an inventory. What has changed? What new challenges do we face? Who's there? What do we have to work with? From remote working to remote access, science and science communication are seemingly inseparable from technology. But this does not diminish our roles as collaborators, as co-creators of a future rich in ideas and exchange. Collaboration should not complicate. Collaboration should not hinder the transfer and development of knowledge. Collaboration should benefit all parties. 
Listen, take an inventory, help science speak for itself. Thank you.